Now, the Three Martini Lunch with Greg Columbus and Jim Garrity. And welcome, everyone, to the Monday edition of the Three Martini Lunch, along with Jim Garrity of National Review. I'm Greg Columbus of Radio America. We have three good martinis today, all of them related to what we know so far from the Mueller report. And all of this is brought to you by Quip Electric Toothbrushes. Right now, Quip Electric Toothbrushes start at just $25. And if you go to getquip.com slash martini right now, you get your first refill pack for free with a Quip Electric Toothbrush. Getquip.com slash martini. More on that in just a moment. Uh, Jim, the first martini is legitimately good. The other two, uh, we needed to mold a little bit, but ultimately I think they're they're good as well. The Mueller report basically concluding that our president did not conspire with a foreign power to manipulate a presidential election. We used to think that was unanimous good news, and I'm guessing that you think that's even better news, at least for the moment, than Rob Gronkowski retiring. So I'll let you get into that later if you want to. But as you point out at the top of the morning jolt today, four major bullet points from the letter that the Attorney General uh, Bill Barr sent over to lawmakers. Number one, the report does not recommend any further indictments, nor did the special counsel obtain any sealed indictments that have yet to be public. Two, the special counsel's investigation did not find that the Trump campaign or anyone associated with it conspired or coordinated with Russia in its efforts to influence the 2016 presidential election. Three, the special counsel did not find that the Trump campaign or anyone associated with it conspired or coordinated with the Russian government in these efforts, despite multiple offers from Russian-affiliated individuals to assist the Trump campaign. And finally, after reviewing the special counsel's final report on these issues, consulting with department officials, including the Office of Legal Counsel, and applying the principles of federal prosecution that guide our charging decisions, Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein and I have concluded that the evidence developed during the special counsel's investigation is not sufficient to establish that the president committed an obstruction of justice offense. To be thorough here, uh, Bob Mueller said uh, there was no evidence to move forward on it, but there was also not enough evidence to necessarily fully exonerate the president on that charge. So, Jim, uh, once again, uh, it's pretty concrete here that there was no collusion, there was no conspiracy, and since we've been uh, swimming in this muck for the last two and a half years, uh, pretty good news to know that uh, after all this digging, no evidence that that existed. Yeah, and this is something that has been a cloud hanging over this presidency pretty much since the beginning. Some might say even going back to the campaign. And let's point out that there were a confluence of, of, you can either say, facts or observations that fueled this theory that Trump was either in cahoots with Russia or he'd been an agent for them for a long time or that there had been some sort of quid pro quo deal of you help us against Hillary, we'll take it easy on you on sanctions. Look. Trump, from the very beginning, was always strangely soft on Putin, and this is not a, a guy who's known for uh, holding his tongue or, or not being uh, temperamental. He did have Manafort as his campaign manager. Manafort had spent a lot of years working in the Ukraine for a, a lead, a, a, the president of that country who was fairly pro-Putin at the time. Um, Flynn went to Russia for that RT dinner, sat next to Putin, and that certainly is the sort of thing that's going to raise eyebrows. You generally don't see a lot of members of the U.S. military get to get close to uh, Putin. Uh, Roger Stone is a weirdo. I, I believe that's the technical legal, legal t- term there. Uh, and, of course, Michael Cohen just looks guilty, um, no matter what he's accused of, just by this, the way he looks and acts and behaves, etc. So you put all that together and people said, aha, there must be something there. And I remember I, I you know, went back and checked because I'm like, boy, would I, at any point did I start, you know, fanning the flames of this or anything? Did I point did I start? And I was you know, pleased to go back and look over what I'd written for the last couple of years, Greg, and come to the conclusion that from early on point, I was like, well, wait a second. Let's take either scenario that, that Trump is willfully and happily cooperating with Putin because he likes Putin and he somehow uh, thinks that there's a great deal to be had in, you know, uh, taking it easy on them with sanctions and uh, in exchange he'll either get Trump Tower Moscow or he'll get the hacking help with uh, with, with uh, Podesta's personal computer and the DNC emails and all that stuff. Or let's say, let's take the Steele dossier. All right, this is the P-tape, all right? This is some sort of nefarious blackmailing of the president, that, that Putin somehow has some dirt on Trump and that, you know, if Trump doesn't do as he says, he'll ruin Trump's reputation. Greg, because you know, <laughs> Trump's got that great reputation for propriety and dignity and, and honorable behavior that uh, could end up being ruined by this. Yeah. And um, 
the, the thing that never quite made much sense is that, you know, this, this would be a big deal for the Russian government. You know, uh, and you, you'd like to think that our intelligence agencies would spend a considerable amount of time and resources trying to watch the Russian government and figure out what they're up against. And even if it's difficult to say wiretap Trump Tower, uh, as Trump uh, accused the Obama administration of doing early in this process, you'd figure that there'd be a lot of resources focused on Moscow and Putin and Russian intelligence and, F- you know, that between FBI counterintelligence, all of the eavesdropping and monitoring abilities of the NSA and everything the CIA is doing to monitor the Russian government, what they're doing, somebody somewhere would have gotten a whiff of this effort to either blackmail or get in cahoots with, uh, with, with Trump. That this would be too big a deal for them to, this whole thing to be ongoing without any actual uh, evidence being uncovered by U.S. intelligence. But uh, apparently Greg Steele goes to Russia a few times, has tea with some people, and all of a sudden he blows this thing wide open. <laughs> that whole thing never made much sense. That always seemed like, wait, really? This one guy figures out something that escapes presumably the greatest intelligence service in the history of the planet? So um, that never quite made sense. So those of us who look at this and said, wait a second, wait a second. You're not going to find a smoking gun of this. You're not going to find a tape of, two, uh, of Putin and Trump cackling together. Um, and go, lo and behold, there was none of that. There, there, as of, uh, it's safe to say, look, we haven't seen the full report. We'll see what happens in the full report. But based upon Barr's summary, that none of, the, none of this stuff, all of these crazy theories, new, the New York Magazine, by, this big, long essay by Jonathan Chait, putting out the theory that Putin had been controlling Trump for like decades. It was just like, guys, he's not the Manchurian candidate, you know? For starters, if you're Putin, would you really want to put that much investment in Trump? Does that seem like a safe bet that this guy's going to be president of the United States someday? You know, it's, anyway, so the whole thing had a come on uh, tone to it. And now after you know nearly two years of investigation, 40 FBI agents and, and forensic investigators and, and all that crowd, 500 witnesses, 500 interviews, thousands of subpoenas. They've looked at it from top to bottom, beginning to end, soup to nuts, and there's no collusion. As the president was saying on Twitter fairly regularly throughout this process, he's fully entitled to dance a jig. I think you're going to see enormous giddiness uh, from this White House and also, I think, from a, a certain amount of effort to go after the people who were uh, calling for this. And I think there is deserving for this accountability. I think there was a, an enormous amount of people who got not just out in front of their skis, but who basically were, you know, uh, con- contrived a, a kind of uh, uh, the sort of thing you'd find in a spy thriller, a sinister conspiracy theory involving Russia and the Trump campaign. Um, and there were lots of early indicators along that this wouldn't really make much sense. Like if you're the Trump campaign, do you, do you go through a Jerome Corsi or a Roger Stone type character? Um, why would they reaching out to these guys to figure out what the Russians knew if they were in cahoots the whole time? So, uh, And as I had said, just the longer the investigation went on, the less likely it was that Mueller was, had found some sort of smoking gun. Because if you find that tape... <laughs> Okay, I'll I'll take I'll get rid of the sanctions if you guys hack into the DNC and into Podesta's emails. Uh, then you probably would want that called to the attention of of Congress and the American public as quickly as possible. You wouldn't sit around for two years before unveiling it all. So every time I made that point, I had somebody you know some snotty lefty saying you know just wait and see, Jim. Well, Greg, we've waited and now we're seeing. <laughs> Absolutely. Can you hear me smiling, listeners? (laughs) And we're going to talk a lot about uh, the fallout from this and uh, the goalpost shifting here in just a moment. But let's just savor the fact that uh, the the person that everybody thought the day he was appointed, whether they thought appointing a special counsel was a good idea, that Mueller was a pretty good choice. And then those opinions changed depending on what rumors were coming out. And the president accused him of witch hunts and the Democrats were – lighting candles with him in uh, like a monk's robe uh, uh, painted on the side. And so uh, all the all the changing narratives here is just fascinating. But for the moment, let's just savor the fact that we're pretty sure one of the most experienced prosecutors in the country does not believe our president colluded with a foreign power. That's good news. Um, and it should leave, unless you're a total partisan hack, a better taste in your mouth. And the, the, the best way to have that on a daily basis is with the Quip Electric Toothbrush. One of the most important things we do for our health every day is brushing our teeth. Yet most of us, believe it or not, don't do it right. We just don't. Quip is a better electric toothbrush created by dentists and designers. Quip was designed to make brushing your teeth more simple, more affordable, and even enjoyable. Dear listeners, I used my Quip toothbrush earlier this morning. I will use my Quip toothbrush later today. 
And depending on how things go, Greg, I may use my Quip toothbrush sometime during this podcast. Um, <laughs> you can just hear it in the background. Uh, it has sensitive sonic vibrations that are gentle enough on your sensitive gums. Some people brush too hard and some electric toothbrushes are just too abrasive. Much like the people who are hyping the Mueller investigation. <laughs> A built-in two-minute timer pulses every 30 seconds to remind you when to switch sides, helping guide a full and even clean, just like people are switching sides on their opinion of Robert Mueller today. Uh, Up to 90% of us do not brush for a full two minutes or don't clean evenly. This is the best toothbrush I've ever owned. I would heartily and easily recommend it to everyone I know, and it's at a very reasonable price. So not only does Jim love it, uh, I've said before that my wife loves it, and they're also backed up by over 20,000 dental professionals. Uh, Just in case the testimony of Jim and my wife aren't good enough for you, 20,000 dental professionals love this thing. It starts at just $25, and if you go to getquip.com slash martini right now, you get your first refill pack for free with the purchase of the Quip electric toothbrush. That's your first refill pack free at get. Q-U-I-P dot com slash martini. Getquip dot com slash martini. All right, Jim, I mentioned the goalpost moving. You got some people uh, speculating. Uh, you got the lefties uh, very upset when we found out on Friday that there would be no more indictments coming. Sean Hannity's practically doing cartwheels, and that's long before we had any sort of indication from the attorney general about what exactly is in this report and whatever conclusions Mueller uh, got to. And so you already had folks saying, well, the real story here is the Southern District of New York. That's where the real action is. Or wait till Nadler and Schiff and other people in the Democratic Majorities in Congress get their hands on this information. So a uh, little bit of a, uh, a timeline here. First of all, here's Chris Matthews on MSNBC. In fact, all of these are MSNBC. Talking to his colleague, Ken Delanian. Why was there never an interrogation of this president? We were told for weeks by experts, you cannot deal with an obstruction of justice charge or investigation without getting to motive. You do not get to motive unless you hear from the person himself who's being targeted, a subject of the investigation. How can they let Trump off the hook? Chris Matthews doing his best Dennis Green there. They know who Trump is, and Mueller <laughs> let him off the hook. So the saint, the saint uh, totally was uh, totally rolled over for the president here. Bob Mueller, who was going to set everything straight, uh, now totally in the tank for Trump or something like that. Rachel Maddow says she was fishing around Knoxville, had to run into the studio because history was being made. A little bit hard to tell here with just the audio, but uh, getting a little emotional there for Rachel as she started spinning up her next conspiracy theory. There isn't anything longstanding because they've never really dealt with this before. But when Barr says he's going to decide what can go to the rest of Congress and what can go to the public, consistent with the law, consistent with the special counsel regulations and consistent with Justice Department policies and practices, that's the part that is going to determine whether we figure this thing out as a country, (laughs) whether we, the country, are ever fully told what Robert Mueller really figured out. So if you caught on to the latest narrative here, the attorney general of the United States now is a Trump stooge, and he's going to make sure that nothing that's at all damaging to the president ever becomes public. In case Maddow's version of that story wasn't uh, blatant enough for you, Joy Reid had on this guy <laughs> named Ellie Mistal, who is the editor, I kid you not, of AboveTheLaw.com. And here is his totally rational, totally sober, totally nonpartisan view of our attorney general and his role right now. Is Trump's flunky going to release a report that might be damaging to his sugar daddy? I don't think so. I don't even know why we think that Barr isn't the one who stopped the investigation. This is a 22-month-long investigation. Barr's been on the scene for a month, and now we're done? That doesn't strike anybody as odd? No, I have absolutely no confidence that Bill Barr will do anything other than what is in the best interest of Donald Trump. So, Jim, our second and third good martinis here kind of run together because they both deal with the media in terms of reaction here. We're going to save the media's horrendous coverage of this entire story for our third martini here. But uh, to watch the goalposts move, to watch the emotion, the disappointment that our president's not a treasonous felon. uh, And uh, now Bill Barr is uh, public enemy number one. (laughs) We have no evidence whatsoever to suggest that he's covering anything up. In fact, he said in his letter that he didn't uh, deny anything to the Mueller team in terms of what they wanted to do here. So what do you make of the uh, the political theater in reaction to this? I'm, I'm, I'm still trying to get over that last soundbite there, Greg. <laughs> Are you telling me you've completed this investigation after just two years? <laughs> 
yeah. <laughs> yeah. What What do you think? Barr stormed into Mueller's office and said, that's it, Bob. You've had enough time. You've had enough money. I'm shutting the whole thing down. And Mueller just said, okay. <laughs> The, does that sound like either one of these two guys? You know, now the great irony, I think one of my colleagues was showcasing the old photo of the two of them back with the first time Barr was Attorney General of the United States. Mueller was a high-ranking FBI official. Uh, just one of those moments where you get the feeling that time is a flat circle and you're always going to be seeing the same faces over and over again. <laughs> um, but uh, look, not only is there no evidence of, of any of that, um, the letter in, that uh, Barr's summary so far, as I mentioned, you have know, mentioned all the, the witnesses, uh, all of the interviews, all of the subpoenas, all the electronic records, 13 requests of foreign governments. You know, I, 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 you kind of knew like, that no matter how long it took, you'd hear an argument that it was rushed. That no matter how many people they interviewed, oh, they neglected important witnesses. You know, they, 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 all of the classic conspiracy you know, lots of stuck on my, stuff on my wall and string connecting them and, you know, wide-eyed, uh, I've got tinfoil on my head style uh, lines of argument. Um, and again, maybe you could say, look, guys, this isn't really journalism. This isn't really serious Democrats. It's Joy Reid and her guests. Uh, but even then, I just think the general tone of it, look, the, the, when, when Barr laid out his explanation of like, it's going to take me a while to go through this and remove the grand jury, like... <laughs> As I wrote about this this morning, Greg, at one point, Alyssa Milano was like, well, if all that exonerated Trump, wouldn't they just release it all, all at once? Huh? And I'm like, well, it, this is right there in Barr's letter. This this isn't, you know, hidden on the Rosetta Stone. This isn't some weird, obscure. Re- it's right. Do you know what you need to do to figure out why Barr didn't release everything at once? You got to read the letter. Now, Greg, it's four pages. Right? I guess maybe that's it. Doug, I can't read the full four pages of this letter. That font is fairly small, you know. But when you get down to it, it says, look, some of this involves grand jury uh, information. Uh, grand juries are not like trials. Trials are generally public records. Everything gets recorded in the, tri- in the, in the court, transcribed, et cetera. And it's all out there in the open. A grand jury doesn't have a defense attorney present. The grand jury's simple goal is to say, is there enough evidence to charge this person of having committed a crime? It's not really determining guilt or innocence. And so because there's that lower standard, courts are very wary about having people talk about what happened inside a grand jury. Different judges will have different standards. Witnesses can generally testify, tell the public about what they said in testimony. Sometimes they can't. You know, Every once in a while, they'll do a gag order or something if it's sensitive matters or something like that. But generally... Uh, prosecutors cannot release stuff that was obtained in grand jury testimony because it's not up to that usual threshold. And this has been in place for a super duper long time. So what uh, what Barr has to do is go through and take out all the grand jury stuff. And then he's got to take out stuff that might relate to other ongoing investigations that were handed off to the Southern District of New York and other U.S. attorneys. Uh, Maria Butina, the, the Russian redhead who was uh, uh, apparently, you know, meeting up with NRA folks and stuff like that. The Michael Cohen case. Uh, there's 12 other Russians who've been invest- who've been indicted over computer crimes and stuff like that. All of that stuff, Barr's got to go through, and he's got to make sure there's nothing in this report that's going to louse up those prosecutions. And that's just due diligence. That's just him doing his professional duties. Um, theoretically, if you release grand jury information and you're a prosecutor, you yourself have committed a crime. So you know, that's why Barr is doing this. Is it going to take a couple of days? Is it going to take a couple of weeks? We don't know. But at some point in the not-too-distant future, we're going to get pretty much the entire... Mueller report minus the grand jury stuff. And I don't think, you know, the grand jury stuff is going to be, aha, that's the the smoking gun. That's the Rosetta Stone that proves Trump colluded with the Russians or, or something like that. Um, secondly, Mueller may have wrapped up his work. If Barr dramatically misrepresented one of Mueller's conclusions, Mueller could always just, you know, call up anybody from the New York Times or do a press conference or do anything you want to say, well, actually, no, I found X, Y, and Z, not A, B, and C as Barr characterized it. And then Barr would be toast, right? Barr understands this is one of the biggest and most important responsibilities he's going to handle as attorney general. So I, my, I believe he played it straight. Now we can go up when we get the full report, maybe we'll find, eh, you know, he shaded it a little bit. He characterized it. He kind of underplayed this aspect. He overplayed that conclusion. You know, we'll, we'll see. But my, 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 at this point, I feel like the safe bet is Barr accurately and, and fully summarized the findings of the Mueller report. And when we get the Mueller report, we're not going to say, oh, this, this doesn't match up what Barr said at all. Oh, this is very dramatic and very different. And again, I don't think we're going to be waiting a terribly long time to get our eyes on the, the full Mueller report. 
happened. So again, this is denial in action. This is psychological refusal to accept the conclusions. Um, it's that old saying with this much, uh, with this much horse poop around, there's gotta be a pony in here somewhere. <laughs> Jim, uh, with everybody talking about uh, whether it's time to move on or the Democrats uh, saying this is just the beginning, uh, you got some folks on the president's side suggesting, well, now that Mueller's found absolutely nothing on the conspiracy slash collusion front, let's figure out how this idea behind this story got started. So they want a full investigation into Brennan and Strzok and Page and McCabe and the Oars and uh possibly all the way up to the Clintons and Obamas and who knows what else. Lindsey Graham certainly seems ready for that. Jim Comey put out a tweet where he was walking in the trees and said, so many unanswered questions. And Graham says, I completely agree. See you soon. So I don't know if he has, I don't, I don't, I don't know if he has big plans for this uh, or not, but uh, other people saying it's just time for everybody to move on. What do you expect? At the risk of sounding like a little David Lynchian, Twin Peaksian, uh, Greg, I'm just going to say when I saw that Comey, picture of him walking in, in amongst those wooded lands. I felt like the subtitle was, I see the trees, but I cannot see the forest. <laughs> so yeah, there's, there's, look, let, let's have that reckoning because as many folks have pointed out, there were plenty of people who made statements that sounded like they knew something big was coming down the pike and this was going to have a smoking gun and boy, oh boy, you know, Trump was doomed and, and all that stuff. Um, I, I think we can begin with, uh, well, actually, I'd like to begin with BuzzFeed for starters that, that, you know, cause remember they, they said, um, that they, you know, that, uh, that Trump had instructed Cohen to lie. It was one of the few times we heard Mueller's office and say, uh, uh-uh, uh, you know, no, we, this, this, that story is not accurate. There was a little bit of vagueness about what in the story they were saying was not accurate. And the response from Ben Smith and BuzzFeed was, no, no, we stand by our, our investigation. We stand by our reporting. And now we know that's not the case. So I'd really love to know how did that story come to pass and how did, you know, like if your sources give you bad information, you can burn them. You're, you're under no obligation to protect somebody who gives you false information. They're using you. Uh, fascinatingly enough, there's no information, no, no indication that that's the case. Boy, Adam Schiff sure as hell made it sound like uh, there was a lot, that there was, you know, concrete evidence of collusion and things like that. Um, I think a whole bunch of Obama administration officials, including uh, former CIA director uh, John Brennan, are, are going to have to ask a lot of serious questions about, boy, a lot of statements he said made it sound like he, he knew something the rest of us didn't. Uh, oh, by the way, worth note, because I had had this question, I, I kind of figured that considering how quickly Trump changes his mind, that by the end of the week, he'd be saying how Robert Mueller was his favorite guy. He always trusted him. He always thought <laughs> you knew he can count on him to do a professional job. He'd never said it was a witch hunt, et cetera. Well, apparently, Jonathan Carl just asked the president, as we, are ha- as we are taping this, Greg, we just said, he asked if Robert Mueller acted honorably, and Trump said, yes, he did. Yes, he did. It is the most honorable <laughs> witch hunt in American history, Greg. <laughs> And that's the point where nobody's uh, opinion on this has really changed despite the uh, the answer here. There might be a few people on the margins, but the Democrats are just digging in and the Republicans are ready to move on. But uh, the media obviously has a lot of egg on its face. you got a lot of folks who pushed against the tide who are feeling vindicated today, and they probably should. Folks like Molly Hemingway over at The Federalist and um, maybe Byron York and, and a couple others. Uh, Jim, you've obviously been very straight with this. Other people have had the agenda. So you've been among the few that I think folks are really ought to respect by just looking at the facts as they come in and assessing them rather than figuring out how they fit into their personal narrative on this. Yeah. But whether the media is going to figure out any lessons from this is hard to say. And the answer is probably no here. Uh, here's two quick examples from Politico uh, just in the last couple of days. There was a tweet this morning that says, After the nearly two-year investigation found no collusion or clear obstruction of justice, Trump and his aides showed little interest in healing or national unity. Uh, Over in another story from Politico that came out yesterday, written by John Bresnahan and Heather Cagle, quote, after months of twisting in the wind over what Mueller would find, Republicans, get ready, gleefully pounced on the special counsel's statement that the investigation did not establish that members of the Trump campaign conspired or coordinated with the Russian government in its election interference activities. So if you're happy that your president isn't a traitor, you're gleefully pouncing. So, Jim, not sure that we're going to get better media out of this. Greg, I have gleefully pounced so much in the past 12 hours I pulled a hamstring. (laughs) I think there's like one other... Uh, angle here that's worth mentioning. 
people are saying, well, Trump's not out of the woods yet. And judging from James Comey's Instagram, neither is he. Um, <laughs> but, you know, oh, there's still the Southern District of New York investigating. Oh, there's still congressional investigations going on. Oh, there's still stuff unrelated to the Russia stuff like Stormy Daniels. Yeah. And, and we don't know how those investigations are going to shake out. And yeah, maybe you'll find something serious or some sort of uh, uh, more critical, uh, you know, evidence of, of criminal activity or something like that. But let's observe this doesn't happen in a vacuum. And then for two years, one of the most respected guys in law enforcement has been looking at every single nook and cranny of the alleged Russia gate stuff. And he didn't find it. OK, the American public, when, when Trump says this was all a witch hunt, this is all fake news, a lot of Americans are going to believe him because a lot of stuff that was said about Donald Trump over the past two and a half years regarding him and Russia turned out to not be true. So, you know, is it more likely that Trump paid off Stormy Daniels to stay quiet? Yeah, yeah. The, you know, there's, there's a canceled check there, right? You know, but a lot of Americans are going to tune this out, A, because it reflects who they thought Trump was. But and also, too, like, you don't get a second bite at the apple in this situation. You don't get to do an enormous, deep, thorough investigation, come up with, you know, bupkis, and then go back the next time and say, well, wait a second, I found something else. And that's why I've been joking today that, you know, if you have any questions, don't worry, they'll all be explained in the sequel to Mueller's report. Um, it's all part, Greg, of creating the Mueller investigation expanded universe. They're going to have lots of <laughs> spinoffs and sequels and prequels going back to the beginning uh, all the merchandising we've seen, the votive candles, the T-shirts. Uh, Greg, I don't, do you want one of those It's Mueller Time uh, <laughs> mugs that they have that look like the Miller Time ad logo? Deeply discounted today, I'm sure. I, I'd like it today. You know, you know I, I think Mueller did a fine job. How about you, lefties? So, there we are. Um, that, hey, you know what? It's, how often do we do? Thank goodness it's Monday, Greg. <laughs> Can we have a moratorium? I just want a moratorium on people who claim like Steve Bannon was up for capital punishment, uh, that they have to be off of TV uh, panels or something for the next certain right. amount of time. Yeah. You know, this, you know, it gives me no pleasure to report this, <laughs> but the death penalty is under consideration. If you'd had money that Jussie Smollett would be in more legal trouble than Steve Bannon on March 25th, 2019, collect your winnings. <laughs> What a day. And the week's only starting. Jim, see you tomorrow. See you tomorrow, Greg. Jim Garrity of National Review. I'm Greg Columbus of Radio America. Thanks so much for being with us today. Don't forget to visit our friends over at Quip. Right now, your electric toothbrush for Quip starts at just $25. Get your free refill pack of brushes at getquip.com slash martini. And tune in again on Tuesday for the next Three Martini Lunch.